Welcome to week three of the class Neural Dynamics. Last week we talked about the model of Hodgkin Huxley. This week we will add more detail. Just as in the previous weeks, we will focus on a single neuron, an isolated neuron, that may be part of the network of neurons in cortex. Last week, we talked about a biophysical model of the type of Hodgkin and Huxley. We included different types of ion channel. However, the neuron was just a point. The neuron did not have any spatial structure. It was a point neuron. Now, real neurons have dendrites. Dendrites have a complicated spatial structure. And so a natural question is to ask, what is happening in a dendrite? Is there any function? What's the role of the dendrite? That's the first point. A second shortcoming of the model of last week was that input was injected explicitly in the form of a stimulating current. You can imagine that the experimentalist injects such a current through an electrode. However, this is not a natural situation. A neuron embedded in a network would receive input from other neurons, and these, this input would arrive in the form of spikes that arrive at the synapse and cause some response on the postsynaptic side. So the second point I would like to raise this week is what happens at a synapse can be describe the activity of a synapse. And it's with this second point that I would like to start. I would like to start with a discussion of synapses. So here is a zoom onto one synapse. And for the following discussion, let's just focus on this zoomed synapse. And uh, to facilitate the discussion, I would like to turn it around by 90 degree and then this is what you see. So here on the top part, this is the presynaptic terminal. Inside the terminal, you'll find vesicles. Vesicles are loaded with neurotransmitter. Some sit inside, some sit on the surface. Now suppose a signal arrives from the presynaptic neuron. The signal would be one of the action potentials that travels along the axon. The axon bifurcates, spreads out, has various ramifications, and one of these ramifications ends at this presynaptic terminal. At the moment when the spike arrives, some of the vesicles fuse with the membrane and uh, eject neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. These transmitter molecules are then captured by the channels. So the channels have sort of sensors that can pick up one of these molecules. And if one of the molecules is captured, then the channel opens and sodium ions can flow inside the cell, potassium ions can flow out of the cell. An important neurotransmitter is glutamate. In fact, this is the most important transmitter at excitatory synapses. One of the excitatory channels is the so-called Ampere channel. If it opens, it makes a thin channel wide enough for sodium and potassium to pass through but not wide enough for calcium. There's another type of channel on excitatory synapses. That's the so-called NMDA channel. If it's open, then calcium can pass through. The dynamics of NMDA is slower than that of the AMPA channel. Excitatory synapses are not the only one. They are also inhibitory synapses. Inhibitory synapses use the neurotransmitter GABA and it comes in two subtypes, GABA-A and GABA-B. So here is a model picture of the different synaptic currents caused by neurotransmitter release. So suppose a spike arrives at the synapse at time zero. If it's an excitatory synapse with many ampere channels, then 
you would see a very rapid rise and it decays within a few milliseconds. If the channel also contains NMDA, then the synaptic current of the NMDA, through the NMDA channels would be much slower and it, it extends over about 100 milliseconds or so. At inhibitory synapses, there are the two channel subtypes, GABA A and GABA B, and uh, one is fast, the other one is slow. So this is the effective current that flows into the cell if a spike arrives at the presynaptic terminal. One of the questions we need to ask is, how can we describe such a current? Can we build a model of such a current? And now we have seen in the Hodgkin-Huxley model that uh, an important notion is the synaptic conductance. So let's build this type of model now. The total synaptic current has a drive, which is the difference between the momentary voltage and the reversal potential. And the index sin indicates it's the reversal potential of the synapse. Now, the conductance is time dependent because the channel opens if neurotransmitter molecules are bound and afterwards it closes again. A very simple model is to say this time dependence is just an exponential pulse. That's the kind of model we have here for the AMPA. Immediate rise, rapid fall afterwards with some time constant tau for AMPA in the range of a few milliseconds. So, suppose a spike arrives, a spike arrives here, we have this jump upwards, this says a spike arrives at time tk, the effect of the spike can only be felt after tk, at times t larger than tk. So this is just the heavy side step function which jumps from zero to 1 at 0. So for t smaller than tk, I have no effect. For t larger than tk, it's just a 1. So essentially this means the exponential curve here starts at time tk and then it decays with a time constant tau. So this is what we have plotted over there. Now, suppose we have many spikes spikes arriving at different moments in time. Then the first spike would cause this response, the second spike would cause another response that act, adds to the first one, the thir third spike would cause yet another response, the fourth and the fifth spike as well. So the total synaptic conductance is the sum over all these different contributions, the sum over all the different firing times tk. And it's this total synaptic conductance that inserted here into the equation multiplied with the drive and this gives the synaptic current. Now a slightly more complicated model would be to say well there's not just this decay time but there's also a rise time. So a spike comes in here it has some rise time and then we decay with a, time, with a time constant tau. So the rise time corresponds roughly to the time it takes uh, to take off from zero. Now this current, again, if there are several spikes, would just add up. So what I've plotted here is the total conductance, and this total conductance is inserted in the current equation. Now the current equation could, for example, go into the hodgkin huxley model. And now there are two different interpretations to do this. One would be to say the total stimulating current is this current here with the minus sign. And that's why we have plotted this here. So excitatory synapses with AMPA channels or NMDA channels effectively 
are equivalent to a positive stimulating current. A different point of view is to say, well, in a real neuron there is no stimulating current, rather there are channels. And this is the sodium channel, this is the potassium channel, this is the leak channel, and then this here is an additional channel that would naturally have the minus sign. So this is a simple model of the synaptic current. So let me summarize. So we have the neurotransmitter glutamate at excitatory synapses. We have the neurotransmitter GABA at inhibitory synapses. And both are described by the same kind of equation. However, there's a difference because the reversal potential at excitatory synapses is high whereas the reversal potential at inhibitory synapses is low. Now, what's the result of this difference in reversal potential? So let's look at the following graph. Suppose this is about the resting potential. So the membrane potential is fluctuating here. Now, if the voltage is about the resting potential, which is maybe minus 70 millivolt, then this drive here, minus 70 minus 0, means minus 70. Multiplied with a minus sign here gives you a big positive driving current. So if a pulse comes in, it gives this response to the membrane potential. Now, if the membrane potential momentarily is higher, like here, then this might be minus 60 millivolt. Well, the drive is about the same. The difference between minus 60 and minus 70 is not that big. So, the size of the response is roughly the same. Not so at inhibitory synapses. Suppose now I have an inhibitory pulse coming in here. My current value is minus 60 millivolt. I put in here minus 70 or minus 75. So the total difference The total difference is about 50 millivolt, and this is the driving force that's, mul that's going to multiply this synaptic conductance, and so this gives this kind of response. However, if at the moment when the inhibitory spike arrives, if at the moment when the spike arrives at the inhibitory synapse, the membrane potential is roughly at rest, then the driving force minus 70, minus minus 75, is only about a third of what it was before. So the same spike will have a much smaller effect at the inhibitory synapses if the neuron is at rest. In fact, if the neuron is exactly at the reversal potential, then the driving force is zero. This is called shunting inhibition. The inhibition drives the membrane potential towards the synaptic reversal potential, but if the membrane potential is already close to the synaptic reversal potential, the effect of inhibition is not visible in voltage trace. It's just visible as a change in the conductance. So synapses are important contact points between neurons. They are important for signal transmission. If a spike arrives at the presynaptic terminal, neurotransmitter is emitted, it's captured by the receptors on the postsynaptic side. If it's captured, then a the channel opens, and uh, which eventually leads to a change in conductance and to an input current into the neuron. And this input 
current can be described with a simple modeling approach. Before we go on to part two, please have a look at the quiz that we have prepared for you.